What is going on guys and welcome back to another very exciting video. In this video we're going to be talking about PayPal and PayPal is a company that I have recently added to my portfolio and what we're going to go over in this video is we are first going to start off by talking about valuation. In terms of valuation PayPal has an absolutely insanely low PE ratio in my opinion so we're going to go over that in this video. Then we're going to take a look at how PayPal's business model compares to a company like Visa and we'll leave off the video by talking a little bit about some of the risks that are sitting behind PayPal that you need to consider before investing in the company. So if you enjoy the video, make sure you drop a like down below. And if you wanna see more videos like this one, make sure you hit that sub button. Let's start off by taking a look at their stock chart. We can see here today, the stock moved up around one and a half percent. Over the last five days, however, it is down over 1%. Over the last month, it gets a little bit more dramatic with the stock trading down almost 20%. And over the last six months, we can see that it's really traded relatively sideways until this last drop off that we see. It was kind of in this range of anywhere from 70 to 75 dollars and then we had this dramatic drop off after earnings year to date we know a lot of big tech companies have been up in a massive way when you look at apple microsoft google tesla meta any of these large tech companies have been doing very very well but when we look at paypal we see that it is down around 20 percent and even before earnings it basically had traded sideways year to date if we zoom out to the last year we see that the 52 week high is somewhere around 103 dollars and if we go out five years this is where things get absolutely insane. We have this huge bump in the stock chart from the run-up of all the online payments that were occurring over the pandemic. But even past that, when we look back to 2018, the stock was trading almost 30% higher than where it is today. And the stock trading at levels that are 30% below 2018 numbers is insane when you look at revenue numbers and the amount of growth that we have seen over the last five years. When we look at 2018, at the end of the year, the company was bringing in a revenue of around 15.45 billion dollars and when we compare that to where the trailing 12 month revenue is sitting at right now it is almost doubled to 28.07 billion dollars and when we look at eps numbers we see the trend continue in 2018 we see that the company was bringing in around a dollar and 71 cents in eps and when we compare that to today we can see that they are bringing in around two dollars and 36 cents in eps which is around a 40 percent increase over the last five years and when we look at this chart we can actually see some of the crazy valuation changes that PayPal has gone on over the last couple of years. We see back in 2018 and throughout 2019, the stock was trading at a trailing 12 month PE ratio around a 50. And then in 2020, it traded all the way up to at one point an 80, but since has traded down in a massive way down to where they have it sitting at right now of a 25.52. Personally, I pay a lot more attention to their forward PE ratio. And right now, Yahoo Finance has them sitting at a 30. 13.48 forward P ratio. We'll run these numbers on our own in a second and actually see that it is currently a little bit lower than what Yahoo Finance has here. But when we look at the last year, we could see that a year ago, it was trading around a 25 forward P ratio. And since it has traded all the way down to where it's sitting at right now, again, around a 13.48. And in terms of earnings, analysts have around a $5 earnings target for this company. We have 38 analysts on Yahoo Finance covering the year of 2023, and they have an average estimate of $4.95, a low estimate of $4.78, and a high estimate of $5.05. And here's what I mean when I'm talking about a lower PE ratio than what we see on Yahoo Finance. So when we run the numbers ourselves, we have, again, the earnings numbers that analysts are expecting here on the left, and then we have the PE ratios that are associated with them. So basically, all we are doing is we are taking the current price of around $60.30 and dividing it by the earnings, and we get these PE ratios. So for $4.95, we have have a PE ratio of around 12.18. For $4.78, we have a PE ratio of around 12.62. And for $5.05, we have a PE ratio of around 11.94. So what we can do with these numbers is we can take them and compare them to potential valuations for the company. And personally, I feel comfortable that PayPal could reach a valuation of a 15 forward PE to a 20 forward PE. I think that should be easily achievable for a company like PayPal that still has a fair amount of growth in front of it. And what that should result in is a price target between $74.25 and $99, which would be anywhere from a 23 to a 74% move up from the current stock price. When we look at the low EPS numbers, we get again that 12.62 forward PE ratio. And when we compare that to a 15 to a 20 PE ratio, we get a price target anywhere from $71.70 to $95.60, which again is around a 20% move up to a 60% move up in the stock price. And then 
then for the high EPS numbers, we would have a current PE ratio of around 11.94. And again, comparing that to a 15 to a 20, we would get a price target anywhere from $75.75 to $101, which would be a 25 to almost 70% move up in the stock price. And when we look at the S&P 500, we can see that it's trading at a valuation of around a 24.34. And in my opinion, PayPal is a company that has a lot more growth in front of it than the average S&P 500 company. I think it could easily get to higher valuations based off the amount of growth that it could have over the next three to five years. So what I wanted to get into next is basically the comparison between Visa and PayPal and how these two business models kind of are similar, but also different. So Visa earns its revenue from authorizing and settling payments, converting currencies for international transactions and related services. The main source of the revenue growth is higher transaction volume through Visa Net. Visa encourages more transactions by issuing Visa branded cards and partnering with other companies to use its network directly. So Visa really dominates the global payment space. However, PayPal is the leader in US online payments. While Visa Net links consumers, businesses, card issuers, and banks, PayPal only facilitates transactions between PayPal account holders. And this is really one of the biggest issues for PayPal because their growth strategy revolves around increasing the number of PayPal accounts and encouraging greater use of those accounts. PayPal has started to branch out their business by partnering with other businesses as well as other financial service companies, including Visa themselves. They also offer their own version of buy now, pay later called pay in four, where they have partnered with retailers to offer short-term installment loans for consumers so that they could purchase products and pay over time. PayPal also offers revolving credit accounts to consumers as well as fixed rate loans to businesses. This does expose it to a little bit of additional risk as there is the potential of those people defaulting on those loans. Another important thing to note is their acquisitions. So in 2012, they acquired Venmo. In 2021, they acquired company called Payday, which is a Japanese-based company. And then in 2020, they acquired Honey, which is a price comparison and coupon finding tool. The biggest bear case that I see against PayPal is the competition that's coming into this space. And that is a fair concern to have with this company because we have companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, Visa, Afterpay, all in this space competing for people to use their platforms. As I mentioned earlier, one of the most important things for PayPal's growth in the long term is growing their active accounts. And we can see last quarter that they announced that they had 433 million active accounts. That is up only 1% year over year from 429 million active accounts. However, when we look at the growth number from a year ago, where they were sitting at, that was 9% year over year growth. So basically what this is telling us is, again, they had a lot of growth over the couple of years when the pandemic was going on, when people were ordering goods from home. And since then, it has kind of cooled off in terms of the amount of growth that they've experienced. The last thing that I wanted to cover in this video is their gap versus non-gap earnings. So when we look at their EPS numbers for gap, we see that they announced 70 cents in earnings in their most recent quarter. And when we look at their non-gap earnings, we see that they announced a dollar and 17 cents in earnings. So I want to talk quick about what that difference is. So down here, they have a very wordy section, but this covers the gap versus non-gap and what's covered between the two of them. So the first one that is causing the difference is the stock-based compensation. That's important. We'll take a look a little bit more in depth here in a second in that. They also have amortization and impairment for acquired intangible assets. This is often like goodwill and other transactions. So things that can't really be quantified into numbers very easily, or they are very opinionated numbers. So goodwill is basically a company's value. If you just basically take the name of the company and what that value presents to it, every company in the stock market has that. So that's very hard to quantify how those numbers basically work out. We also have restructuring costs. Those are going to be important. We'll take a look at those here in a second. Gains and losses on strategic investments. They have that indicated in there as being about 20 cents of that difference. And then we also have certain other significant gains or losses and benefits or charges, and then the tax effect of non-GAAP adjustments. And in my opinion, there's really two of those metrics that are most important. The first being stock-based compensation. When we look at stock-based compensation in 2019, it was sitting around $1.02 billion. And that took a very dramatic jump up in 2020 by almost 35% to $1.37 billion. It flat 
flatlined from there in 2021 to $1.37 billion again, and has seen a drop off in 2022 to $1.26 billion. I believe that will continue to drop because of what we are going to look at here next. And that is their employee count. We can see in 2019, they had 23,200 employees. In 2020, they grew that number by almost 15% to 26,500 employees. Then they grew again by around 16% to 30,900 employees. And then in 2022, they started announcing layoffs and reducing some of these costs. So they brought that number down to 29,900. In 2023, they announced an additional 2,000 employees will be laid off. This is about 7% of their workforce. This will not only help their costs, but it will also reduce the amount of stock-based compensation that they have to issue out. So this should be a benefit for the company in the long run. However, in the short term, there will be fees and severance packages that they will have to issue out that will hurt some of their earnings numbers. So with all of that said, personally, I do like PayPal for the long term. I think that they have a lot of growth in front of them. There is a lot of competition coming into the marketplace, but the fact that they are trading 30% below where they are trading five years ago and the amount of growth that they've experienced over the last five years is absolutely insane. I think they are more of a value play. They're not going to be the number one player in the payment market space. I think Visa, I think Apple Pay, there are a lot of big players out there, but the fact that PayPal is trading at such a low valuation for the amount of free cash flow that they're generating, the amount of revenue that they're generating, the amount of EPS that they're generating, I think is absolutely insane. So keep in mind, that is all my opinion. Do not buy a company just because some random guy on YouTube talked about it. Make sure you are doing your own research, looking into companies that not only meet your risk tolerance, but also meet your time horizon. So with all that said, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure you drop a like down below. And if you want to see more videos like this one, make sure you hit that sub button. And as always, guys, have a wonderful rest of your day.